I'm Andrew Huberman, and I'm a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford School of Medicine. For how to optimize these incredibly powerful things that we call hormones. Well, what's really interesting is that there are very clear ways in which patterns of breathing, especially patterns of breathing in sleep, can modulate hormones in ways that are immediately actionable and can serve to optimize both estrogen and testosterone, regardless of whether or not you have ovaries or testes. Apnea is under breathing or mainly cessation of breathing during sleep. So people are holding their breath and then they'll, they'll suddenly wake up. I should have talked about the physiological sigh on previous episodes of this podcast of this pattern of double inhales followed by exhales that one can do consciously to reduce stress and anxiety and offload carbon dioxide. That pattern of breathing is actually what kicks in spontaneously anytime we have an apnea episode in sleep. Although in many people who have apnea, they don't engage the physiological sigh. But the issue of breathing itself can be adjusted in the daytime waking hours in ways that can powerfully impact both sleep, reduce incidence of sleep apnea, and apparently from some emerging literature can also help to optimize various hormones even just by breathing in particular ways while awake. So here's how this works. There's now a lot of literature showing that breathing through the nose, not through the mouth, is powerful for improving lots of things. First of all, it improves cosmetic features of the jaw and face. Mouth breathers have changes in the cosmetics of their face and jaw that are really bad um, in terms of att uh, attractiveness. And this was done in twin studies. It's really dramatic how being a mouth breather tends to make the chin drop back be behind the upper mandible. There's a lengthening of the face, a drooping of the eyes. It can be quite dramatic or modest, depending on how much mouth breathing. Now, sometimes we have to breathe with our mouths, but there's also a lot of data and studies described in this book, Jaws, that describe how nose breathing in wakefulness and in sleep promotes all sorts of positive things related to not just cosmetics, but also the improvement of gas exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the body. And as well, it can modify levels of different neurotransmitters and neuromodulators in ways that positively can impact hormones. So believe it or not, being a nasal breather and avoiding being a mouth breather can actually positively impact hormones, and in particular the hormones testosterone and estrogen. Although the way that it does that is by making you a better sleeper, which allows you to produce more testosterone and appropriate amounts of testosterone and estrogen, but it does that in part through indirect mechanisms because deep sleep supports the gonads, the ovaries and, and the testicles, and the your turnover of cells and the production of cells. Remember in the in the ovary, particular cells and the egg follicles themselves make estrogen and in the in the test in the testicle that the Sertoli cells and the Leydig cells are important for the formation of sperm and for testosterone respectively. So what does this all mean? This means we have to be breathing properly. It almost sounds kind of, uh, you know, uh, like kind of new agey, like, oh, you have to breathe properly to get your hormones right. But no, you have to breathe properly to get your breathing and sleep right so that your sleep can actually be deep enough and you're not entering apnea states. And then that will support gonad function. And I wouldn't be putting this out as one of the main behavioral tools up front if it weren't for the fact that the effects of apnea on these hormones are dramatic and terrible. And the positive effects of getting breathing right on these hormones, testosterone and estrogen, are dramatic and wonderful. When apnea is reduced in sleep or eliminated, there are significant increases in testosterone in males and in proper estrogen to testosterone ratios in females. And the way that it works is very interesting. Apparently, it works by reductions in cortisol. Now, cortisol is a stress hormone that is released early in the day as we wake up and serves healthy roles in protecting us against infection, reducing inflammation, etc. But you don't want cortisol to be too high and you certainly don't want it elevated too long throughout the day and night. And so we all know, because now we've been told a lot in the last decade or so, that getting proper sleep is important for all these aspects of health. Getting proper sleep can um, really offset all the reductions in testosterone and estrogen and reductions in fertility that occur if we don't get enough sleep. But seldom is it discussed how sleep actually adjusts things like testosterone and estrogen. And it does it by modifying cortisol. So the molecule cholesterol can be converted into testosterone or estrogen, but there's a competition whereby the cholesterol will turn into cortisol and not testosterone, or it'll turn into cortisol and not estrogen if stress levels are too high. So the simple version of this is getting your breathing right during the waking hours, meaning 
primarily, unless you're working out really hard or there's some other reason why you're maybe eating or speaking, that you need to be breathing through your mouth, you should be a nose breather. There's really good evidence for that now. And in sleep, you also want to be a nose breather because that's going to increase the amount of oxygen that you're bringing into your system and the amount of carbon dioxide that you're offloading. There are other positive effects of it as well, but you're basically reducing apnea. Breath holding in sleep leads to buildup of carbon dioxide and leads to increases in cortisol, which then decrease testosterone and decrease estrogen in negative ways across all sexes. So nowadays, there's a lot of interest in using cold as a way to stimulate testosterone. This is mainly because in the, you know, in the sports community, in particular in the bodybuilding community, they are always seeking ways to maximize testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, keep estrogen to its minimum required to still have libido and still have, you know, skin elasticity, but also walk around with saran wrap skin, then all this kind of extreme stuff that happens there has led to a recent movement where Believe it or not, I heard this and I, I couldn't believe I went and checked, although I didn't buy them, that on Amazon, you can actually find uh, people have their literally underwear that have ice packs, or I think they're ice pack underwear, so that people are making themselves cold at the level of the gonads in order to try and increase testosterone and libido. <laughs> Sounds pretty crazy. Put simply, we don't know whether or not cold and heat directly affect the, product, the production of testosterone and estrogen. We only know that cold and heat can modulate those probably through indirect mechanisms like controlling the amount of blood flow by way of shutting down or activating the neurons. Now, there's a lot of lore around heating up the gonads too much. There's actually a, a whole set of um, pseudoscience uh, web pages out there saying, well, if you want a girl, you should you know, conceive the child at this room temperature. And if you want a boy, you should conceive the child at this room temperature. I, I don't think there's really any firm scientific evidence for that, uh, for either one. But there's some interesting literature about temperature dependence of production of hormones. And I think that it probably relates to these mechanisms of vasodilation and neural control over vasodilation. And of course, excessively high heat is not good for the testes, for sperm production, or for sperm health. Sperm have all sorts of proteins in the cap, things like pentraxins and other things that cause them to swim faster when they're uh, expressed properly and in the right locations. And heat actually alters the location and the function of a lot of those proteins. They're very heat sensitive. And so that's why excessive heat is truly not good for fertility, which may be independent of heat's roles in promoting estrogen or testosterone. 